accessing those superconscious states, channeling it into our consciousness, and therefore becoming better decision makers, having more alacrity and clarity in our, in our intuition. What is intuition? Is it cognitive? Is it emotional? Gut feeling, instinct? Is it something that comes through a process of intelligence? Or is it an emotional instinct? We know it's not based on conscious reasoning, but still, where does it come from? Where does it originate from? And can we trust it? Can you trust your gut instinct? Can you trust your intuition? And above all, can we do anything to hone and improve and sharpen that intuition? Or are some of us just wired with more intuition than others? Now this is a vital question because it addresses so much of our decision-making process. We know that whenever there's a decision to be made, then you have to at times apply your mind, your research, you do your due diligence, discovery, to see whether the options and to see whether it's worth engaging, worth involving, worth investing in a particular entity or not, a particular time and energy and commitment or not. <clears throat> We also rely on our emotions, our feelings. But feelings can be subjective. So we try to combine reflecting with our minds, which means objectively, dispassionately analyzing and processing without any conclusions. And then we allow our emotions then to give us a sense. Do I feel that this is the right thing? Am I attracted to it? Am I repelled by it? So where does intuition fit into this? Is that an emotion, part of the emotional part of it? Or is intuition really something deeper from the subconscious that you just can't put your finger on as you would in the conscious reasoning, but it's lying somewhere embedded in the back of your mind? And that's informing you as well. So that's what we want to address. So really what we need to do is explore and probe the inner workings of consciousness itself, the inner recesses, the deeper recesses of the mind and beyond. So I've talked about this topic from different angles in the past, but I'm going to sum it up this way. Long before Freud and long before modern psychology, the concept of a conscious versus an unconscious or subconscious is discussed at length in Kabbalistic texts. But I'm going to use not the word subconscious or unconscious, but rather the word supraconscious. And the reason is very simple. Because consciousness is what is revealed, what we're aware of. When you say sub, it sounds like beneath, like a subterranean state, underneath the consciousness. Unconscious can also be a non-conscious state, but superconscious implies directly and implicitly that you're talking about a superstate, not a substate, a superstate. And that's very significant because does consciousness, do we start with consciousness and then we travel into the basement, into the subconscious or the non-conscious? Or does it begin the process in the superconscious state and then it enters the regular conscious state, which is what we're aware of? And of course, the latter is correct. So superconscious is a far better word. Another point is the unconscious or the subconscious in modern psychology is often associated with, especially in Freudian psychology, with the id, with the libido, with these untamed forces of pleasure, principle, sexuality, of the raw core person that's not, well, before it's regulated by ego and superego. So it has also that, that implication as well as being sub, meaning it's like hidden. It's like almost something that we don't even want to look at. It's ugly. Whereas superconscious is the exact opposite. Suprastate, a state beyond conscious that then seeps in into the consciousness. And let's analyze how that works exactly. And this is taken straight from, based on texts of the Zohar, which is the classic book of Jewish mysticism as explained by the Arizal, 
who was a great mystic, one of the greatest mystics, maybe the greatest in the 15th, 16th century, and as elaborated upon in the discourses of the Chabad Hasidic discourses that make it more palatable and explain it in, in more rational terms. This is an example that I use. It's not written exactly, but I think it captures it well. Let's think of a faucet, a water faucet in your sink. The water faucet is a regulator, right? It regulates the flow of water. When the faucet is closed, nothing is flowing. That doesn't mean there's no water. There is water. There's water in the pipes. There's water in the pipes going into the house, under your sink. The pipes that are connected to that, the larger arteries, all the way to the water main to the street, which in turn connects to the reservoirs that gather water, that pump water to different, all the different arteries and different um, veins and network of what the water, the water uh, infrastructure, the water skeleton, if you wish, that exists in any particular city. So when you turn on the faucet slowly, what happens is water begins to flow. When you open it up a little more, the valve opens more, it flows more. If the faucet breaks, for example, you have a leak. And it could be more than a leak, it can actually flood. <clears throat> That's a good example, not a perfect example, but a good example to understand how the superconscious interacts with the conscious. The conscious mind is a faucet. It's regulated and the flow of ideas comes in drop by drop. If we had a rush of ideas without any control, without any regulation, it would drive us mad. So when you have drops, it's a drop. That's why you have like a flash of an idea. It's like a flash, a drop. Literally like that, like a flash. Where's that flash coming from? Where's that drop coming from? From a large body. Sometimes some call the collective unconscious the collective conscious, the collective unconscious, we'll call it the collective superconscious. So it's a superconscious state. The word used for it in the Kabbalistic texts is moiche or moiche or chachmas tima, the hidden wisdom, the hidden intelligence, meaning it's hidden on the other side of the curtain. We only see the drop, or we recognize and perceive when an idea falls into our minds, we perceive that the drop but we don't see where the drop is coming from. All we can say is, what, where did that come from? And we recognize there must be something behind the curtain. So you have Chachma Geluya, which is revealed consciousness, and you have Chachma Stema, concealed consciousness. Concealed here really is not just concealed, it's actually supra, beyond consciousness. In there, that level itself of the superconscious, there's two states. One, that is closer to the conscious, it's just concealed, meaning it's right before it's about to be revealed. So it's just a matter of uh, time or a matter of effort. And then there's a concealed superconscious that's fundamentally concealed and never is accessible. So essentially, when we think of an idea and we conceive of something, it's coming from that superconscious state, the higher superconscious, that then in turn turns into the lower superconscious, which in turn will send us a drop will send us a drop of water through our faucet and regulation and regulator that allows that idea to enter into our consciousness. That's why you'll find, for example, the idea is this, that you'll find there's a very thin line between genius and madness. Genius is when the faucet is as wide as possibly open and still that we can maintain our sanity. Madness is if it opens just a drop too much and the flow is too intense. When we talk about a chemical imbalance, the chemicals in the brain, they actually are forces that compartmentalize experiences, compartmentalize ideas that don't let us get overwhelmed by a very negative trauma that completely consumes us. It compartmentalizes, it regulates like a faucet. So if the faucet is a very narrow one, so the ideas flow in a narrow way, but a genius is on the border of madness. So actually madness in a way is closer to reality then is sanity. Sanity is controlled reality, basically. Regulated reality, so we can contain it and not be blown away and not be overwhelmed and, and completely suffocated, completely submerged and flooded by its truths. That's why when someone says, I want the full truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, truth has to be packaged. 
because it's very difficult to just have the naked truth. Sometimes it's too overwhelming. Now, package doesn't mean manipulated and it doesn't mean distorted or diluted. It just means it has to come piecemeal. Think again of the faucet. Think of raindrops. If the rain would come down in floods, it would drown. It would, it would, in, 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 in a flood, in floods, it would flood the fields and destroy them just as much as a drought would. The beauty of rain is that it's rain, but it comes down in drops, so it can be slowly absorbed by the earth until the next drop comes. So it's paced properly. In love and relationships and communication, the same is true. You may have great ideas to share, but if they flow so quickly that the container, meaning the recipient, the student, the teacher, the, the student is unable to contain it, then you have yourself a problem. That's why we need to then regulate and make sure that the process is, is properly balanced. That's the key to all communication. And the same thing with love. Communication, if you just let it pour and pour, and you don't spoon feed it, and you don't recognize that different students and different recipient, recipients need a tailor-made and adjusted flow, you can overwhelm them. The same with love. We can suffocate people and drown them in love because it's love on our terms, not on the recipient's terms. So in the Kabbalistic terminology, that's, the energies have to be contained in the containers. You pour a pitcher of water slowly into a cup. You don't just pour it because it'll over, it, it may not only it won't fill the cup, the cup will be completely empty because it'll overwhelm the entire container. <clears throat> so this flow of superconsciousness to consciousness needs to be regulated. And that regulation includes a concealment that we are not in touch directly with what is going on behind the curtain. But it's still always sitting there because that's where all consciousness comes from. So with that in mind, then let's talk about the conscious now and the superconscious. So conscious understanding of things, as I said, conscious reasoning is when you sit down, you use your mind, you analyze, you process, you try to figure out how something functions, something works, and you do as much due diligence as you need. Where are you really, where is the mind accessing? The mind is really accessing superconscious energy or superconscious intelligence but, it, as I said, it has to flow step, step by step, drop by drop. Then there's the next step. After you process, intelligently you say, okay, now, in a healthy process, I objectively researched this. I objectively have come to a conclusion this is good. And now you let your emotions come into play. And the emotions, the heart, says, you know something? I'm listening to what my mind is, my reflective mind is telling me. I'm not just acting impulsively which is the nature of emotions. The impulses are now being guided and directed like a captain of a ship is guiding the ship and the experience. Now the emotions feel comfortable to now experience it. Because remember, in the mind, it's a process. It's a computer. It's a machine. The emotions experience. So here you have it. The superconscious is behind the scenes, the two levels I spoke about, the one that is completely, but always remains concealed, and the next level is the one that is just concealed from the conscious. <clears throat> then the conscious leads to an emotional experience where you experience it to the fullest sense. You love it, you bond with it, you connect with it, you commit to it. That's the healthy process. Just as an example, going back to the two levels of superconscious, one classic example given in the Hasidic discourses is the difference between a flintstone and a uh, hot coal. Both of them have the power to light and ignite a fire. What's the difference? A hot coal, a white hot coal, you may not know there's fire there because it's not obvious. It's inside the coal. But if you fan it, or God forbid you touch it, you know very well there's fire. And, and you take that hot coal, put it into water, it will extinguish the coal. A flintstone, you can put it into water and it won't affect it. You can fan it, you can touch it, no fire. But if you strike it with exertion, with effort, that's when you get a spark out of it. So that is called a concealment that doesn't, is not, doesn't, that it's concealed in a state that does not yet have substantial existence. And the flame within the hot coal is considered the superconscious that is just concealed from the revealed state. And revealed consciousness 
is the coal that, that is flaming coal that we're conscious of and we can sense and be warmed by and be, um, and be touched by. So there you have those levels. And then comes, of course, the emotions is the experience. So let's take this now back to intuition. Intuition is actually the bridge between superconscious and conscious and between conscious and emotional. So my question I asked earlier, is it emotional or cognitive? It's both. It is the beyond re- conscious reasoning is when you sit down and you calculate and you come to a mathematical or scientific or some other logical conclusion <clears throat> about whatever it is that you are researching. Intuition, we call the gut feeling, the instinct. But we're talking about an informed instinct, not just a, an intuition. Where is that coming from? That's coming that the consciousness is able to sense something from the superconscious. And it's also able to sense it, the emotion, an emotional instinct is also able to sense it. When is that healthy and, pos- and, and works well? When you have the flow, the way I described it. If you just go with your own passions and say, hey, I like something, I'm drawn to it, and you're not using your conscious mind, then most likely your intuitions and your gut instincts and, and, um, will also be compromised. That doesn't mean they don't work. But when you are able to have what is the most important step of all, bittel, the ability to, to strip, to, um, to suspend yourself and your ego, to reach a truth that's greater than yourself, then the channel of the sub- superconscious from the higher superconscious travels to the lower superconscious that travels into the conscious and then is, is expressed in an emotion and a feeling driven not just by consciousness, but by consciousness informed by superconscious. That would be called the intuition part. Now, you could have intuition without a conscious state. You could just say, I sense something is right about something. But you always want to make sure. So you always want to look into it a little more. The instinct and the intuition doesn't go away. So the intuition is essentially a glimpse into the superconscious telling you and informing the conscious there's something here. Sometimes you can go by that. Sometimes you need to check it, all depending how evolved you are, which is what we're going to speak about now. Because now the question is, what can we do anything to sharpen and hone our intuition? And based on this, absolutely. Absolutely. But it requires this type of what I said, this type of bitl. If you're going to say, you know what, just give me three, five, three, four, five steps, how to hone my intuition so I should be more intuitive. If it's ego-driven or it's just success-driven, it's not going to work. Because that doesn't open up the door. That's not a key. Arrogance or even self-awareness and self-interest, I should say, is not a key to opening up the secret mysterious doors of the superconscious. What is? Humility. Humility. <clears throat> Humility is striking yourself, like striking the Flintstone and pushing aside your crass ego, your outer layers of, of that are intrigued by something or really want something and you're driven to be humble. And as humility takes over, the superconscious speaks to you. And it speaks through a healthy intuition. So the key to honing and improving and sharpening intuition is, frankly, humility. Humility that allows you to allow, that allows you to access the channels behind the faucet, to widen those channels, and to allow more to flow in. Sometimes will come in the appearance of an idea, but sometimes even deeper in an instinct, a resonating sense of truth. And that's why the way the Kabbalists and the Hasidic masters explain this is they say Chachma. Well, I should explain. I mentioned Chachma before. But Chachma bin Adas are the three conscious states. The three, I should say, the three stages of conscious intelligence. The cognitive process. Chachma is the drops that I mentioned before, the flash that comes from the superconscious. The faucet. Bina develops so a faucet is a drop, or even more than a drop, a little flow, but it's not a river. Bina is the width, the width and expanse of a river. Takes the drop and develops it into a full-blown idea. And das is the conclusion where you connect, where you relate, where you're ready to act, where you're ready to emote. So let's now think of the process. Chachma, as opposed to Bina, Bina understands, so it's, it has to be about you. 
You must be conscious. You cannot understand something if you're not conscious. Chachma is a bridge between conscious and superconscious because Chachma says, I got an idea, but I don't fully understand yet. As a matter of fact, what dominates is the awe, the wow. Chachma is the letters koyachma, the power of what? What? What was that? You ever have that type of profound pleasure where you have a serious problem, you have a dilemma, and then an idea drops into your head. There's a certain, like, a certain flash, a certain euphoria consumes you. That's coming from that superconscious state that entered through a drop, but only through a drop. Bina, I understand. Chachma is the idea is being understood. Chachma focuses on the truth, the resonating truth of the idea. Whereas Bina is focusing on I understand. Not, or sometimes we can say, Chachma, the idea consumes you. Or I should say, the idea intrigues, it, 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 the idea consumes you, encompasses you, and being is you encompassing the idea, you absorbing the idea. So the you is more significant than being. It's necessary for the integrative process, but for the truth, and sometimes compared to also visualization, the resonating truth, it's almost like you see the idea, that's chachma. Being is you hear the idea. So when you, someone tells you, let's say, they saw a beautiful sight, a beautiful painting, a beautiful natural sight, natural um, event, and you were not there. So when you see it, you see the whole thing in one shot, and you may not even understand it. And then you can start analyzing piece by piece, but the seeing is a certain resonating power. Seeing is believing. You say you had to see it. What about when you relate it and you tell the story well? You can relate the narrative to somebody. So there, as good as you do, will never have the resonance of this as someone who sees it. But you have something else. When you have to tell it, you tell it piece by piece by piece. So it's much more understandable. Seeing can lead to a state of awe and say, I don't even understand what I saw. When you have to explain it or describe it and depict it, you go detail by detail by detail. So Bina is the details lead to the big picture. And Chochmah, the big picture, leads to the details. And that big picture is informed by the superconscious. And what opens up the door? Humility. The effort, the exertion of humility. And intuition is what enters into this conscious, that resonating sense of truth. That's not just I reasonably understand it, but I sense, I feel, it resonates that it's right. The gut instinct. That in turn is developed by Bina into a full case, but it has to always retain the resonance of Chachma. That through Das will then become an emotion where you experience a true idea. You experience a truth. You experience it. So that's the process. So how do you hone and sharpen that? By opening those channels. The more humility, the more you're focused on the truth of the idea. Not that I understood it, but the idea is true, which is ultimately real wisdom. It's not about me understanding. It's not an ego trip. It's not a mind game. It's about that you have the honor and you're blessed with the opportunity to recognize a higher truth. Because take away the mind, we would be emotional creatures completely subject to impulses. Our intelligence would be there to satisfy our emotions, to hunt, to preserve ourselves, preserve our young, and so on. But being that we have a mind, and a mind that can be an objective mind, that can rise above our needs and our survival, which distinguishes us from the plain animal, that allows us to what? To recognize a higher truth. That wisdom is actually leading you to a place that's beyond your subjectivity. And then that higher truth comes back and informs your emotions. So there you have it. The process is quite straightforward, and this is the formula. Accessing those superconscious states, channeling it into our consciousness, and therefore becoming better decision makers, having more alacrity and clarity in our, in our intuition, sharper and more sensitive intuition, and ultimately our decision-making process affecting our own lives, our relationships, and everything that's happening around us when it's going in this direction. So ultimately, where is reality? Reality is in the superconscious. That's reality. It's beyond the structures that we know. We don't really have access to it directly. The fact that some people have induced through psychedelics and other means access 
even if you were to say it has some access, but it's not sustainable. That's why it's so difficult to uh, be grounded after that. The sustainable way is when you know how to access it naturally, and naturally through humility, through recognizing and wanting to be a channel for a higher truth. And when you are able to do that, then the flow begins to, the energy begins to flow into you, into your being, into, into being internalized and being experienced. And Purim is, in a sense, the day of the year when we're able to achieve that. We're able to reach that level. So this is truthfully accessible to everybody at any time. But there's the big prerequisite. You can't want it too much. Because if you want it too much and your want dominates, then your sense block off the door. You ever see the things that you experience only when you allow it to emerge? If you try to grab it and pull it, it becomes elusive. The more you grab it, the more it eludes you. The less you grab it, the, lo- the more you create an environment to allow it in, the more it becomes part of you. So we have to, re- we have to, we have to resist the temptation of trying to own it, to trying to hold it. Truth, love, soul, God. Everything, of the, all, all real things in life are not owner. Own, are not subject to ownership. They all emerge and they all come through a process. You do the right things, you water the garden, you weed it, you nurture and cultivate it, the flowers begin to emerge. Same thing with ourselves and with our superconscious. It's there, waiting. But the way to do it is to put yourself aside. I want to channel a higher truth. And then what happens, you get into that zone where it just flows seamlessly. And you cannot distinguish between yourself and the idea flowing through you. Just an example that everybody can relate to. You ever been absorbed reading a book? You're so absorbed you don't even know you're turning pages. You don't even know you're reading words. You can cry, laugh, and be completely consumed. Completely absorbed. What's happening? You've lost sense of self and now you've been encompassed, engulfed in the experience. Like literally immersing yourself in water. And the story, the narrative is completely encircled you where you don't sense yourself and you allow the story just to carry you. That's why we find the expression in the book of Isaiah that in the future, the world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. Okay, filled with divine knowledge is beautiful. What's the emphasis on waters cover the sea? Because that's what happens in water. A fish in water is a fish, it's a creature. However, it's a creature that's completely submerged in its source in its root in its source of life its life source it does never know it never feels that it's separate from its life source we on land can convince ourselves we're separate that we're independent entities but we are all truly submerged in a higher truth except we don't see it we only see what's on this side of the faucet not on that side of the curtain we want to see it we want to access it so what you have to do is get yourself out of the way you move yourself out of the way Purim, layada, you move your knowledge and intelligence and all your methodologies and strategies and all your machinations and manipulations and everything you use to maneuver, all your maneuvering, then what happens? A deeper truth emerges and it takes hold of you and you allow it to seep through you. That's what happens. It's a tremendous experience. We wish we can bottle it and hold on to it. But you have to just let it be. Literally like going un- underwater and just allowing yourself to be submerged. That's the point. And that's the power. And then you come to realize it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about a higher truth that we have the privilege, the, bl- the blessing, the gift to channel. So each of us is born with our unique soul, with our unique contribution, indispensable mission to accomplish in this world. We have all the resources we need from the emotions to the conscious to the superconscious to the super super conscious but we have to do our part and our part is the humility necessary to recognize you're here not to satisfy your own needs you're not here to just have pleasure to have fun to live day-to-day instant gratification that the greatest fun is getting beyond yourself allowing those higher truths to channel through you that's what you have to ask yourself all the time and especially on a holiday like Purim. So the joy of Purim, which is a joy, a joy beyond structure, 
What's the joy? That's the greatest joy. Not a joy, I am happy. I'm doing something that gives me joy. A joy that you become an extension of the archetype of the entity, the energy called joy. You're not just a joyous person. You are joy reincarnate, incarnate. You're a personified joy. You're a joy that's being channeled through your arms and legs, through your singing song. When you hear a song and you're like, let's say you put on the headset and you're completely consumed by a song, it's exactly like being consumed under the, uh, and submerged in water. You're not listening to the song. You're not part of the song. The song is channeling through you. You are now like essentially a, a, um, an earpiece of the song, a channel, a microphone, a uh, use whatever analogy you like. <clears throat> and it's amazing, that experience, because you get out of yourself and you now become part of something greater. And that is fulfilling your purpose and your calling. And yes, the more you do that, the more you hone and sharpen your intuition and your higher states of super consciousness to the point that it becomes part of your reality, day-to-day -day reality. Yes, your conscious state is informed by it. Your sharper consciousness, sharper emotions, more accurate, more truthful, and more what you need, not what you think you need. More giving you a fulfilling life of realizing your deepest purpose. And everyone should have only revealed joy in everything you do. God should bless you. And we're here every Wednesday at 8.30. And, uh, of course, it's archived. You can access it any time. Please share, comment, send us your suggestions, your thoughts, meaningfullife.com. And as well as help us continue this great work by donating generously, especially on a day like this, Purim, by sponsoring a program like this or other programs. And you just simply go to MeaningfulLife.com slash donate or MeaningfulLife.com slash sponsorship. Thank you so much and be blessed. Happy Purim.